I'm going to uh, very unashamedly talk mostly about research we've done at the Resolution Foundation about the about what it says there about the initial impact of COVID on household incomes, thinking about how the labour market shock has affected people and then how policy, what, what policy is done to mitigate that and then what the overall response is. I think um, I joined Resolution Foundation at the start of March. I had two weeks in the office and then we all got sent home and then all hell broke loose. And it's been absolutely exhilarating ever since to be, well, it's always exhilarating to be in an economics think tank at a time of, of massive economic crises. Um, it's, but it's been uh, very, very rewarding too. And I'll, I'll, I'll share with you now some of the work we've been doing. Uh, just a brief outline so you know what's coming. Um, these sections are all very short. I'll talk a little bit about the, the, the background of coronavirus. And then the meat of the talk is, first of all, explaining the nature of the economic shock and what sectors of the labour market have been affected. Point three will be the role of policy and what policy has done to mitigate that economic impact. And then we put, the two, put all those both together and we look at how household incomes have changed, what's happened to the income distribution. But in this crisis, looking at income alone gives you a misleading impression of what's going on because of very particular nature of this crisis. So we need to look at household spending and household balance sheets to get a true picture of the distributional consequences. And I'll see a few words about what's next at the end, although predicting anything in this crisis is of course, extremely difficult. Uh, well, the land before coronavirus, I've just got one slide on this, which is really to remind you that, um, that back in January this year, Resolu we at Resolution Foundation were saying what a truly awful decade it had been. Uh, for living standards for economic growth. So the uh, chart shows GDP per capita in there and how that's changed over time in since each of the last three economic recessions in the UK. And the green line at the bottom showing that uh, 12 years after, um, what, 12 years after the, the, the pre crisis peak in 2007, 2008, uh, 12 years later, GDP per capita is only 5% higher in real terms, which is an astonishingly small rate of growth over that period of time. And that's much worse than the uh, recession, than, than the recovery after the recession of the 80s and the recovery after the recession of the 1990s. Um, I'm showing this chart for GDP per capita, but I could also show it equally well for average earnings, which only just got back to their pre crisis peak. And I could also show it for household income which uh, certainly in the bottom half of distribution has performed very poorly in the last uh, decade. So we didn't go into this crisis in great shape. Then we have, uh, I'm not sure, can you see that yellow line on my screen? I'm not quite sure what that's doing. Anyway, uh, we'll have to work, through, work with that one. Um, then we, yeah, then along came coronavirus. And uh, this is where you start bringing out all of your superlatives. So the chart is showing uh, GDP growth. Uh, this, is this time it's month by month GDP growth. Uh, the blue line is showing how GDP evolved uh, when the financial crisis hit, a fairly slow and gradual move towards positive growth towards a recession. Uh, the coronavirus crisis affected us much more quickly and to, much, to unprecedented depths when GDP fought at its worst, falling to 25% below its pre-crisis level as we went into that um, the full lockdown in the spring. Since then, GDP has then grown at record levels, uh, but we are still, the economy is still 9% smaller than it was before the crisis hit, which by itself is a, uh, is a really staggeringly large amount. And the crisis has been rooted in certain sectors. Um, it, the common theme uh, is that, well, they were, as you know, if you think about it for, for a little bit, the crisis is caused because the government shut down various bits of the economy or has put restriction, heavily, heavy restrictions on some parts of the economy. And it's doing that, of course, to tackle the public health emergency. And not all sectors of the economy are equally at risk here. Um, they're just those sectors where it's difficult to socially distance or where the spread of the virus seems particularly common that have suffered the worst. So this chart is again, it's showing GDP and how that has fallen since the crisis began. The blue bars are showing what happened during the first full lockdown. The red bars give the latest position. Uh, the sectors that were hardest hit in the first lockdown would have been hospitality. That's accommodation and food at the bottom. Sorry, I can't smell accommodation. Um, 
construction, transportation, and other services, which would include things like leisure and tourism. And we also have wholesale and retail in there as well. Now, since April, of course, bits of the economy have opened up. Uh, the, 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 the fall in GDP is, is uh, smaller than it was, and the, but the uh, worst hit sector remains the hospitality sector, I said, followed by this other services, which would include uh, leisure, uh, leisure and tourism. Um, and then so given those sectors were hit very heavily by the need to impose social distancing restrictions or by, or by, by being told to shut down altogether, then that has then translated into a labor market hit that is concentrated amongst the work kind of workers who work in those sectors. And people who work in hospitality, leisure and retail do tend to be fairly young, a fairly low pay and often on atypical contracts. And that explains the next few slides. So when we then look directly at the labor market hit, you know, we, we, we see a pattern that is really um, mostly dictated by the sectors that have been affected by the by the crisis. Uh, so this chart is showing data from a survey we fielded in September, and it's looking at all those, of, of all those who are in work in February, how many of them are working less or not working at all in, in September. And on average, about 11% are, that's the other sectors, are working not at all or working less than they were in, in February. In hospitality and leisure, all those people who were in hospitality and leisure in February, that figure is for over 40%. So the black bar is those who are no longer no longer working. The red bar is those who were furloughed in September on the job retention scheme. And the blue bar are those who've had their pay or hours cut for other reasons. Um, I haven't, uh, yeah, and I'm just giving you a glimpse there that there isn't much difference between men and women. Uh, at least in this measure of being affected by the crisis. Um, workers from minority ethnic backgrounds were, slight, were, were more affected, have been more affected than white workers. There are many other, many other breakdowns in our report. Uh, and I should say that the, the original source of all of our slide, of all of these charts, sorry, is will be the last slide of my presentation, which I guess I will make available through uh, the department uh, later on. Uh, so, focused on certain sectors, those sectors do tend to employ younger work, sorry, these, these sectors tend to be badly paid. So this is the same analysis, but cut by the quintile of earnings distribution that you were in back in February. So of those who were in the poorest, the, the lowest paid quintile in February, we think about 30% by September, were either no longer working, were furloughed or have lost hours and pay. That's much lower for higher quintiles, so there is something going on at the top as well. Now, it's true that normal labour market churn would mean that not everybody in work in February would still be working in September. So you would expect some of these numbers to be zero. Uh, and you might also expect labour market churn to be a bit higher for the lowest paid compared to the highest paid. But these levels of turnover are, far, are, in fact, are indeed, as we show, far higher than you would expect in normal times. And then the, the final cut of this data is just looking at the pattern by age. Uh, hospitality, retail uh, do employ disproportionate large numbers of young people. And it is, and so it's young people who have seen the, felt the brunt of the late market shock. So that's just under a third of under 24s uh, who were in work in February, no longer in work by September. And we have excluded students from all of this analysis. Although we, there is also something going on amongst older workers. Um, and actually we at Resolution do tend to focus on younger workers quite a lot, but the, the, the hit to older workers is also concerning. I think as we know from previous crises that older workers can be finding more difficult to respond to shocks. And uh, so, so certainly a pattern we would have seen in the 1990s recession is that if, if older workers lose their job, that tends to be a route into an unplanned early retirement which can be worrying for their living standards in, in future years. But I don't have much more to say about the older workers today. So that's a little tour through the distribution of the labor market hit. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the policy response. Uh, again, you can bring out all of your superlatives here. 
Um, the policy response was also unprecedented, both in the size, the amount of money that's being spent on this, uh, lost, lost count of how many, how many tens of billions are going on these things, but again, it, it's, it's, just, it's just staggering. Um, and also how quickly they were developed. I mean, it really, both of these schemes, I'll, I'll talk about in a minute, were developed in a matter of days back in March when the crisis first hit. So what we're talking about here is the job retention scheme. And that's, the, uh, that's, the, 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 that's what I meant earlier when I was talking about people being furloughed. So employers can put their employees on furlough and then they can use the job retention scheme to cover their wages. And it, it pays up to 80% of employees' previous wages up to a cap. The aim of this originally would have been to preserve job matches as well as income replacement. So it's trying to preserve job. The idea of furloughing an employee is that you, you just temporarily lay them off because uh, you've got a short period where you don't need them, but with the idea is you can then bring them back quickly afterwards and you preserve that link between employer and employee, which is a value to both. Uh, but it's, it's, it's aiming to do that and it's also aiming to act as income replacement. And the second program will be the self-employment income support scheme that also, uh, potentially, perhaps, sorry, that provides grants of up to 80% of your previous profits. There are quite a lot of conditions um, associated with this program, which mean that uh, quite a high fraction of self-employed people don't get anything as a result. And there's been a lot of talk about that. I think one important point here is, is just to say now is that um, at a, there's not really a mechanism that requires a self-employed to show that they have suffered an income hit because of the crisis. It really is quite a, a light touch scheme where you just have to uh, you know, verify, assert, or say that your uh, business has been affected and then you get, get, then you get the grant. Uh, so we have got these two very generous schemes. They contrast with key features of the existing UK welfare state and the existing UK welfare state instead has uh, flat rate benefits rather than earnings rated benefits and a heavy reliance on means testing to provide additional support to those with extra needs. So let me spend a slide looking at that uh, pre-crisis social security system. So this chart is showing, uh, it's, it's quite a complicated one, I realize it's showing replacement rates. So it's, it's, it's showing uh, if you were looking at all workers in the economy and asking, well, if you were made unemployed, uh, what would your out of work income be as a fraction of your in work income? And we do that calculation accounting for the benefit system, but also accounting for other people in the family. Uh, and on average, the uh, replace, so that's the, the black dots on the all column, the median, the median replacement rate across all workers pre-crisis would have been 50%. So somebody made unemployed would expect to get 50% of their, of their uh, in-work income were they to be unemployed. That might seem high to some of you. That's probably because, that's because it's a measuring income at the family level. And so if you had a partner in work, that, that, would, that would tend to increase your replacement rate. Um, the main rate of unemployment benefit before the crisis hit was just £75 a week. And you can sort of see the effect of that, particularly if you look at the line for single people. So single people are unlikely to get anything, anything else from the welfare system other than the basic rate of universal credit or job seekers allowance, 75 pound a week. And obviously they haven't got anybody else in the family whose income can support them if they were to lose their jobs. So there we see the median replacement rate is less than a quarter. And if you sort of squint at the bar and read the legend, you can see that, or you can infer that 30% of single people will have a replacement rate in that light pink area. That's below about 16%. So 30% of single people would expect to get with out of work about one sixth of their in work income. So had the crisis hit with only this in place, then it would have led to a living standards disaster. Uh, and that is, that is, of course, why the government did rush to introduce the job retention scheme and the self-employment grant. And they did also uh, put in a boost to benefits too. They increased universal credit by £20 a week along with tax credits and increased the support we give to renters through local housing allowance. Uh, sorry, I've jumped ahead of myself there. So the, the, the yeah, this is, again, this is a pre-crisis picture. Um, probably as a result of these 
low replacement rates. Uh, this is also using pre-crisis data where people were asked, how long could you make ends meet if you lost your main income source of your household? Maybe just focus on the blue bars for now. So that shows that in the bottom four deciles, about 40 to 40 to 60 percent, depending on which decile you look at, uh, would not be able to last for a month without their main without their main income source. Um, but financial precarity, which is which is how I would describe this, is not limited to those on low incomes. Even if you look at deciles six and seven, so those are people who are just they're in the top half of the income distribution. Um, between a fifth and a quarter of them say they also could not last for a month if they were to lose the main source of income in their family. So yeah, so those two slides together, I think, provide the context that helps explain why the government rushed to introduce the, the job retention scheme and the self-employment uh, grant system, and why they also put in a, 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 that um, extra money into the welfare system. So having done that, what do replacement rates uh, look like now? Um, well, the purple bars show replacement rates for people who were moved on to the job retention scheme or who were able to claim the self-employment grant. So our thought process there is imagine a self-employed person loses all their self-employment income and instead gets a self-employment grant. So now we have replacement rates um, hovering around 90%. Um, they're bigger than 80% again, partly because of some people will have other members of the family who are also bringing in income. Uh, the green bars with the black dots show replacement rates right now in the benefit system after the 20 pound a week increase. You have to flick back two slides to compare them to the previous slot. They have, they, they've, they've changed a bit, but they haven't changed very much. So now in, in, the, in the new world with, with new, the new um, increased levels of universal credit, the median replacement rate is 53% rather than the 50% that it was uh, pre-crisis. So what I take from this is that the job retention scheme, the self-employment grant are very successful in providing income protection to those who are able to benefit from those schemes. But for those who were not able to get onto those schemes, then the benefit system alone provides much lower levels of income replacement. So why might you not have got onto those schemes? Well, uh, it's up to the employer whether they put their staff on the job retention scheme. And some employers just might not want to do it and might instead prefer to make you redundant or let you go. Uh, if you're on insecure or zero hours contract, you can be put on a job retention scheme. It's just, again, it's just a bit more difficult in proving what were your average earnings. And certainly in the case of zero hours contract, you know, the employer just has a, has a pretty good incentive just to say, okay, I'm gonna row to you at zero, hour, zero hours throughout the crisis, and then you, you wouldn't get anything through the JRS. Uh, for the self-employed, I think, as I mentioned earlier, although I don't want to go into the, to, to some of the details, there were some various cliff edges and eligibility conditions to get onto the scheme, um, which if you, if you missed out, if you couldn't, if you couldn't become eligible, then, then you, you get nothing. So yeah, big, certainly a big difference in the generosity of the schemes uh, if you were not able to get onto the JRS or the self-employment craft scheme. Okay, then I have a few slides on what sort of people have been benefiting from those schemes. Well, I'm going to show you various age cutoffs, age, sorry, distribution by age. Uh, this is showing who uh, was put onto the job retention scheme. The blue line on the left hand axis is just the number of people, number of workers of different ages who at some point were put on the job retention scheme. The red line shows that as a fraction of all eligible employees. So looking at the red line, it's about 30% of eligible employees were at some point put on a job retention scheme, but that fraction goes up considerably for younger workers. So for workers age 20, it is nearly 50%. Uh, the self-employment grant scheme. Uh, so this chart, um, so the blue bars are showing the age distribution of all self-employed workers just according to the labor force survey. The red bars are showing the age distribution of those self-employed workers who HMRC think were eligible for the self-employment grants. And the green bars show how many of those actually made a claim during the first six months of this scheme's operation. So self-employment in general is skewed towards uh, middle-aged and older workers. You just don't get very many young self-employed workers. 
and that is broadly mirrored in that pattern that's broadly that's the blue bars but that's also mirrored in the pattern of who is eligible the red bars and who is claiming it the green bars uh, if 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 you actually turn these numbers into, into percentages it turns out that the the middle-aged self-employed workers are slightly less likely to be eligible than younger workers but a bit more likely to take it up and then the uh Oh, yes, sorry. but the, the, the big criticism of the self-employment uh, income support scheme is that it's poorly targeted and poorly targeted in, in both dimensions. Uh, so this is a, another quite a complicated chart. So this is again showing data from our survey where we looked at people who were self-employed before the crisis started. And then in every month since the crisis started, they're telling us whether they had no work, no work at all, the black bars, or whether their earnings had gone down. Uh, and the, the, the first impression you get from just scanning both charts is that the self-employed were hit harder than employees. And that is that is definitely the case. So just jumping to that September figure, 15% um, on the left, 70% on the right. So of all those self-employed workers in February, about one in six were not working at all in September. And that's higher than the rate for employees that I showed you several slides ago. So point one is the self-employed were hit hard, have been hit harder than employees. Uh, but then point number two, what are the two different graphs? Well, the one on the left is all those people who told us they had claimed one of these self-employment grants. And the one on the right is the people who told us they had not claimed one of the self-employment grants. We couldn't, uh, we couldn't tell, we can't work out, we couldn't ask whether people were eligible. We just, worked out, just, we just could ask whether they received one. So on the left, those are the people who did claim the self-employment grant. Uh, now, most of them did indeed also report that their income had fallen. Um, but in total, only only 78% had ever had a pay fall in one of these six months. So in other words, 22% of that group who claimed the self-employment grants told us that their incomes had never fallen below its pre-crisis level. So at income there, we asked them explicitly about their self-employment earnings, not their overall income. So their self-employment income did not fall during the crisis, but they still claimed the self-employment grants. Uh, that's the statistic on the right there. One in five self-employed workers who claimed a self-employment grant, it did not experience a port fall in pay. And that cost the government uh, just under one and a half billion pounds, that, that, that degree of port targeting. And then on the right-hand side of the group who did not claim the self-employment grant, um, and there, uh, there's a word missing, but there, uh, two thirds of those did actually experience a fall in pay. And if we just, and then focusing on the figure in September and that black bar that we, we, show, we show there, 17% of, of those in September are not working at all. That's about a half a million self-employed workers who were still not working in September and who had not claimed the self-employment grant. So it is, I mean, we could have a sort of study, study this in its own right, but it is, it is not, not a great policy. Let's leave it at that for now. And then finally, the extra welfare support. I said earlier, the government put £20 a week onto the main rates of universal credit and to working tax credit, and also increased support for local housing allowance, which helps people who are renting. Um, this chart is just showing who benefited by age and you know, how many people benefited sorry, at each age. The, it's not showing the, the change in the caseload of welfare benefits, it's showing just who benefited from the, the £20 a week increase, given current caseloads. And it, sh it is reflected that the, eight, the pattern that you see, which is peaking of adults in their early 30s, reflects that that is a part of adult life where you are most likely to have children and that families with children are more likely to be receiving welfare benefits than those without because you get extra welfare payments because you have children. And then we could uh, put the three together if you just to look at, yeah, put three together. And then the blue line is the number of people receiving job retention scheme. The red line is self-employment. The green line is additional welfare support. And the da dashed black line is the, is the total who receive any of those allowing for all the overlaps. I'm not trying to say here anything about, uh, well, this, so I'm certainly not saying anything about generosity, although we do have a slide in a report which shows you how much money was paid to people of different ages. I'm also not showing, saying anything about who was entitled to get what or who is missing out from getting what. This is simply an analysis of who in the end actually got something from one of these schemes. 
Uh, okay, so that was a, a tour of the labor market impact and then a, a quick tour of the three main policy responses. And now I'm going to talk you through the impact on household incomes. Um, I think in some of the some of the, the blurb for this talk and certainly on Twitter, uh, people have, it, the department has been linking to a, a paper that came out over the summer by myself and Laura Gardner, where we took a very first look at how household incomes have changed. I'm going to show you uh, different results today from a paper last month, where we looked again at what was going on in September. So some of the results are a little bit different. Uh, we could perhaps discuss that at the end. Um, so we're switching now from thinking about the labor market to thinking about household incomes. Um, and I showed you earlier that low earners were definitely in the, in the front line of the labor market shock. And that translates more or less to income, but not quite. Uh, so the graph here is showing the experience of labor market change amongst adults, uh, grouping adults into different quintiles of the income distribution of the pre-crisis income distribution. So the pink and red are showing the adults who have experienced some sort of negative labor market shock. They're either out of work or they've been furloughed or, uh, or, or, or were furloughed at some point between uh, March and September. The blue bar is unaffected, but the purple bar is the new thing here. And that's the proportion of adults who were not in work before the crisis came along. And if you weren't in work before the crisis started, then you can't have been affected by the labor market shock. So actually it's the second income quintile that has seen the most people affected negatively by the labor market shock, just because the lowest income quintile well, tends to contain a lot of people who are not in work to start with. Um, then you know, very, very uh, reassuringly, our, our data, this is again from the data we collected in September, is showing that the government schemes did indeed protect household incomes. So we asked people to tell us how their income had changed. Uh, we, we did put some numbers on it. So decreased, decreased a lot means it fell by more than 25%. Decreased moderately, it fell from 10 to 25%. So we look at the top row, that is showing that somebody who is no longer in work, but they had a job before the crisis hit, and they've not been put on furlough. In other words, that's somebody who lost their job, made redundant, or then you know, some other reason for stop work. More than half of that group have seen their household income fallen by 25%. Uh, if you're on, uh, if you've been furloughed though, you can see that is that is protecting your household income. So if you put full furlough, then it's only 14% have seen the biggest income hit. Uh, and if you're on partial furlough, which is where you're allowed to work a little bit and the government tops up your wages, then the income hit is again smaller. So the furlough scheme seems to have seems to be working, it's doing something at least to cushion families from the loss of uh, earnings. Then I've got two lines on the self-employed. I think that's just underlying that the self-employed are uh, have been hit uh, you know, very badly by this crisis, particularly compared to employees. And then if I go on to the next slide, we can look at what's happened to those who were on benefits. So the top bar there is the situation for those people who were new to benefits. So they were, they were not receiving benefits in February, but by September they were, and 43% of them report that their household income has fallen by a quarter, or at least a quarter. I mean, that, that shouldn't be surprising. That is broadly in line with, with such, such as certainly not no different, not a surprise given what I showed you earlier about the replacement rates. Um, it's also uh, broadly matches some data that the Institute of Fiscal Studies have been analyzing, looking at people's actual bank accounts, where they show that for those families who began a claim of universal credit during the crisis, the median fall in income was about 40%. Uh, so put all those together, so bearing in mind that the lowest income quintile is, 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 does contain a lot of people who are not working, so not affected at all. Uh, and, and then remembering that the, the, the government schemes do protect, do protect you against earnings force to some extent, we get this overall picture for the, the distribution of income changes. Um, it's, it's, well, 
the the bottom the, the two results, I suppose, are that there is a little bit of an in, a little bit of a distributional pattern to this. The low income households are a little bit more likely to have seen incomes fall than high income households. But that gradient is a lot flatter, uh, certainly a lot flatter than it is uh, according to earnings, which I showed you quite a few slides ago. Uh, and it's also got a lot, got a bit flatter now compared to the situation uh, in in the in the initial spring lockdown. But the, I think what we'd, argue, what we'd argued in a couple of papers is that looking at income alone, though, in this crisis is not a good way to assess the distributional impact of on living standards. And we need to go beyond income and look at spending and household uh, balance sheets. And the reason for that is the... Um, well, it's, it's, it's due to the, the underlying cause of this crisis, which is the government shutting down various bits of the economy. And as the government shut down various bits of the economy, particularly in the initial lockdown period, then just our ability to spend money uh, was reduced. So again, from our survey in September, asking families how their spending had changed compared to the situation before the crisis. Uh, the top bar is the situation during the first lockdown in the spring, and we have about a third of families say they're spending less than they would have they were doing before the crisis. Some spending more, but not as many say spending less, and that reduces a bit in the in the in the summer, the reopening uh, phase. But there's still a a, a very high uh, fraction of adults or families sorry, who are reporting spending less than they would normally. Now, again, of course, spending fluctuates month by month, year on year, so as does income. But these fluctuations, these changes, are higher than you would expect to find in normal times. Can't remember why next slide is. Yes, and then, um, so what we, argue, what we argue is that, of course, some of this reduction in spending will be due to the fact that families have seen their income fall. And that's a natural response to someone losing their job or you, have, you fear losing your job. You, you're gonna curtail your spending, cut back in certain areas. So yes, sure, some of this fall in spending probably is indicative of a change in your underlying living standards. But other parts of this fall in spending, we would argue, are essentially uh, enforced saving. You know, it's just not been possible to go on foreign holidays, go to restaurants as much, uh, go and spend money in the first period of lockdown. So some of it represents yeah, enforced saving. Now we can see that very clearly if we look at how um, families report their spending has changed by their pre-crisis level of income. Uh, which is a slide I haven't got. Um, and that very clearly shows that the higher was your income before the crisis, the more likely you are to report your spending has fallen. And, and whereas low income households are actually more likely to say their spending has gone up as a result of during the crisis. I haven't got that slide. I've got the, sort of the, net, the, the, the better one, which I think is looking directly um, at what, how, what households say has happened to their saving uh, in September compared to before the crisis start. Um, it's split by their income quintile. So the red bars are households who tell us they are saving less than they were before the crisis start. And the green bars are households telling us they are spending, saving. Sorry, did I say saving for the first time around? It's all about saving. Red bars saving less, green bars are saving more. And uh, very clearly shows that the higher income families are the ones who have increased their saving during the crisis. Um, it indeed, um, whilst some families have been able to increase their saving during the crisis, probably because they just can't spend the money, uh, other families, those who've lost their jobs, uh, will be eat eating into their savings. So we asked uh, people whether they've been using their savings for everyday spending during the crisis. Some say they have. Uh, quite, I, I don't, not sure I quite believe the levels on this chart. That does seem quite a high average if you were to take it, but uh, take the average, but a very clear gradient there that it's the people who, who went into the crisis with the lowest levels of saving are the ones who are more likely to say they've been using that saving to pay for everyday living costs. So that's, that's suggesting that this, the crisis is exaggerating uh, inequalities that were already there. Um, or we can look at the fraction of adults who said they have been borrowing or borrowing money formally or getting support from family and friends, again, to pay everyday living costs. 
uh, and there's a very clear distributional pattern by that to that too. Again, the levels the levels are again quite high, but the distributional the the, the, the gradient is very clear. Um, so yeah, to the, to the 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 conclusion we draw from those two sections, the income section and the spending section, is that income alone in this crisis is not sufficient to get at the true distributional impact of the crisis. You need to go and look at income and spending together, or the different, or, or what is the difference to look at how savings, about saving balances have changed uh, during the crisis. And there you see the, a, a very clear pattern that that the the higher income fam families of higher incomes or families with higher wealth have been much more likely to see their household balance sheets improve during this crisis. Lower income families or families with lower levels of wealth have more likely to see their balance sheets worsen. Um, a couple of slides on what's next. Uh, I mean, who knows, right? What, what, what's next really depends upon, um, well, I guess we don't, well, sorry. Predicting, predicting anything in this crisis is very, very difficult because the situation just seemed to change month by month. The, the sort of talk I would have given when, when David first asked me to give a lecture is different from the one I've actually given because the crisis has evolved, more data has come out, policies have changed. Um, we now seem to be in a situation where the vaccine is imminent. And although you know, we're not all gonna get vaccinated immediately, uh, it does seem likely that certainly by the end of next year, we should be in a world that's much, much more normal. So it does feel like you know, the, the end of the crisis is in sight. Um, and, and when we think about, certainly when we think about the, the GDP shock I showed you at the very beginning, I think that's, that, that probably has, we we're over the worst, right? It was, it was the hard lockdown in, in, in April and May that caused that precipitous fall in, in GDP. Since then, it has been rising. It may have fallen back a little bit in November when England went into lockdown again, um, but it's, you know, we, we are basically on the recovery path now for GDP, but that's, that's not that's not the case for the labour markets. Um, so the, the GDP hit may have peaked, but the unemployment peak is yet to come. And as the chart shows levels of unemployment over a long period of time, along with several people's forecasts of what unemployment might be. There's the little light blue line there, which is what the OBR was forecasting before the crisis hit. Uh, how naive those days seem to be. Um, and then a series of predictions. So back in July, the OBR, that's the Office for Budget Responsibility, were produced a, a very pessimistic forecast of unemployment, thinking it would peak at about 12% around this time, around now. Um, well, since then, the economy has performed a little bit more strongly than they thought it would back in July, but very importantly that the furlough scheme, the job retention scheme, has been extended. It was due to end at the end of October, and that was why the OBR thought unemployment would spike uh, in, in the winter. But the, the furlough scheme, the job retention scheme, is now carrying on until the end of March next year. Uh, and now, so now, now both the OBR and the Bank of England think that that means unemployment will then spike shortly after that. So they're both predicting an unemployment rate of about 7.5% uh, to occur in the second quarter of next year. And then uh, a, re a recovery of sorts over the following four years. But yeah, but the, the key point is that although the, 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 the big hit to the economy has, has happened and we're probably in a recovery from now on, we've got unemployed, more unemployment pain to come, essentially because it's being hidden by the existence of the job retention scheme. And we think that the job retention scheme is, is not only protecting workers whose jobs have been affected by the crisis, we think it's also protecting workers who would have been redundant anyway for reasons other than the crisis. So we think that job, it's like the job retention scheme is just sort of putting a bung in the whole labour market. It's just, well, not bung wrong, it's sort of freezing everything. Um, particularly now we're back in a relatively generous job retention scheme where employers do not have to contribute much themselves. If, if as an employer you you know you, you would have made a you would have made somebody redundant, it, it's you know you, you might as well put them on the job retention scheme, keep them on, and, and they get they get eight percent of their previous wages. So we can see that by looking at the outflow data and the inflow data, it, it does look like the job retention scheme has really just slowed down the the natural churn of the labour market enormously. And so when it comes to an end in in March, then we will we we will we will see uh, this rise in unemployment. 
uh, and it, yeah, sorry, and, 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 and that, will, that, that will be the case even if hospitality and other sectors are full go, because we'll see a rise in unemployment, not, not just because of the crisis, but also because of all this sort of pent up unemployment that hasn't happened anyway, because employers have been able to put people on the JRS. Sorry, that wasn't explained enormously well. Um, So unemployment's going to be peaking in the second quarter of next year, we think. Um, the government's current approach to the welfare system is to take away that additional £20 a week in benefits in April, which will be just as that unemployment peak hits us. So I said earlier, the government put £20 a week onto universal credit and working tax credits. It confirmed it was, it said it was doing that for a year as a temporary measure, and it is still the stated position of the government to take that away again when April comes around. Uh, they, they've not categorically confirmed that they're not going to continue it, but that's still currently their stated position. And I and I and we understand there are you know, heated discussions going on within the government between uh, number 10 and number 11 DWP about whether to carry it on. Um, we think it would be a really bad mistake to take away the 20 pound a week. Um, it would be, very bad for low income families. So this chart shows you how much low income families would be set, how, sorry, how much all families would be set to lose in pounds per, week, pounds per year and as a fraction of their income. And this is looking not just at those families who get universal credit, this is looking at the whole, the whole distribution of all families. Um, so that 20 pound a week, thousand pound a year is worth about 5% of after housing cost income of all families in the bottom uh, decile or two, bottom quintile, I think. Um, and it represents about the total cost is somewhere between six and seven billion pounds. It makes little sense from a macroeconomic point of view either to take seven billion pounds out of the economy uh, in April. But that, that is not, although I say GDP will be recovering, unemployment will be rising. And I think it is, it is far too early to begin uh, to be begin to introduce a, a consolidation on the economy. So it'll be good economics and good for families living standards if that £20 a week was continued. That's one thing to look for. Then the, the, the other problem, and this is the, 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 the only chart that's not from Resolution Foundation, uh, a chart uh, drawn by my former colleagues at the IFS. Uh, let me explain the chart first and then say what the problem is. But the, the, the chart is showing the average earnings of people of different ages born in different decades. Uh, the very broad pattern shown by this graph going from right to left is that each successive cohort of people earned more than their predecessors at the same age. So those born in the 1920s earned more than those born in the 1910s at the same age and so on and so on and so on until you get to the uh, cohort who were born in the 1980s in dark green and they have earned less at every year of their lives than the cohort born 10 years before them, 1970s. And there are several reasons for that, but the most important reason is that the cohort born in the 1980s would have been hit by the financial crisis when they were at an early stage in their labor market careers. And having been hit by the, having encountered the financial crisis at some point in their, uh, in their, in their 20s, this, they then carried that scar with them throughout their throughout their labour market uh, history ever since. So the real question, I mean, a really really important question about the current crisis is: is the current generation of school leavers, university leavers, the people who are in their late teens, early twenties now, are they going to be hit by the same uh, scar to their labour market uh, future? Um, we don't yet, we don't yet know, but it's also it's within the power of policy to influence that. Uh, we, we certainly know that long periods of time out of work are extremely damaging, both to someone's mental health and to their future labour market outcomes. Um, and the government can, can affect that very, very clearly, uh, both through measures like uh, Kickstart, which provide jobs, which would provide subsidised jobs to young people who've been out of work for six months, but also through measures they can take to actively stimulate job creation in those parts of the economy that, that, that are safe to operate. Uh, I think I, I, I'll wrap up there. So, so far the, the, the pandemic has seen a, a really big hit to low earners, which has led to a fairly even hit to household incomes, partly due to the way that 
people sort themselves into households, but also due to the role of policy in protecting some of those income pools. But as I've argued, it's not enough just to look at incomes, uh, especially in this crisis. We need to look at household budgets overall, household balance sheets. And there we can see that the crisis is leading to a very regressive inequality enhancing impact. High income, high income families have strengthened their balance sheets. Lower income households have taken on more debt. Um, I mean, this slide might be anticipating some of the difficult questions you throw at me, and it's sort of six ways of saying I don't quite know what's going to happen next. Um, but uh, what, you know, what, what is on the horizon? Firstly, we've, we've got to get used to a world of high unemployment again. Um, I showed you the slide, the chart a few slides ago, but we, you know, once we had got over the hump of unemployment from the financial crisis, we have been living in a world with very, very low unemployment. Um, and that is, that's not going to be the case for a few years now. That's going to change... Um, benefit policy, but our, our approach to the labour market, but also our politics. Um, we don't think that the crisis is going to change, make too many long lasting dramatic changes to the way we live our lives, to our economy. Instead, it think more that it's accelerated what were ongoing structural changes. So yes, the high street is taking a hammering, particularly this week, that's become really evident, but the high street has been in decline for years. Uh, yes, there will be more home working in a few years' time uh, from, 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 you know, compared to last year, but actually the fraction of professionals who spent some time working from home had, had been rising uh, steadily before the crisis. Uh, we are likely to see, well, well there, is, there is a real risk that we are likely to see another really dismal decade um, with low levels of growth, squeeze on living standards, undoubtedly, you know, Big pressure on public finances. I didn't talk about that at all. But that's something the Resolution Foundation's already written about. Uh, and potentially a deepening of generational gaps, given how young people have been hit particularly hard by this crisis. Um, I think the crisis has highlighted various problems we knew already existed. The, uh, the, it's highlighted the downsides of insecure, atypical work. They were the first workers to be dropped when the crisis hit. So they have not been well protected by our um, welfare state. Um, we've seen how important and how poorly paid social care is, um, but that doesn't mean that we're likely to see any any action on them. So I think really we should think about the future as being addressing old problems, familiar problems, but being a little bit pessimistic in more straightened and more difficult circumstances, both for living standards and thinking about public finances. Okay, I'll uh, end it there, I think. Thank you for listening.